Partners uh, Group. It's uh, built and operated by ESA, you know, in the area where you are in Europe. Uh, it has a lot of fantastic science in it, a lot that we're doing uh, ourselves uh, here. And it also contains, obviously, the communications module, uh, the rack that I'm able to talk to you on. Um, and across the way, if you've studied and looked at the ISS, you know, we have the Japanese module over to my right and then down the corridor, you know, through node two to the U.S. lab. So it's a busy place with 11 astronauts on board now, including the Russian segment and everybody's busy as can be. Fantastic. It sounds like just just amazing. Um, so, John, we'd love you to show us some of what's possible up there that, that it maybe isn't possible down here or maybe talk to us a little, bit, a little bit about some of the science that you've been involved with. Certainly. Well, you know, the, the thing obviously that is different primarily from being um, uh, you know, on the International Space Station in orbit uh, around the Earth is that we are experiencing microgravity. Uh, it's not zero G, you know, there's a difference. We, we are still under the influence of Earth's gravity, but because we're traveling forward at over 17,000 miles an hour, uh, we're falling forward about as fast as gravity tries to pull us back to Earth. So we're basically all in free fall continuously. It appears in a state of weightlessness. Uh, and that's like, you can easily to demonstrate that by a nice little ball here. You can play with that. And everyone, astronauts love to play with things that uh, can demonstrate microgravity. We love to float around. I would love to show you a flip or something, but it's quite a tight area and I'm not that great a flyer yet. Come back in a week and we can see that. Um, but many other things you know, that we like to do, uh, we, have, you know, we drink water out of a pouch. We call it a glass, normal glass won't work. And we have water and we keep a towel nearby whenever we drink water. So we can keep our water from going anywhere, but Water comes out very easily uh, in microgravity into little forms, a little ball on the end of our drinking straw. So uh, that's one of the aspects of drinking water in microgravity. You have to be very careful. You can spill your glass out of the top of the glass. Um, and when we're looking for our food or candy, that's also pretty, it can get away from you pretty easily. I've got a couple of little things here to show you. It's amazing how easy it is to, for things to get lost here on the station. There's a lot of air circulation that moves through the station all the time um, across all the, the racks and equipment because they produce a lot of heat. Um, but we're doing a lot of science in the glove box today. Um, also a lot of science on you know several racks that are quite busy. So when we have a little something to eat, we just park it nearby and go back and get it. So that's our little candy. Fantastic. Um, so, so John, can I just, um, I, I've got a few questions from some of our students, if I can, if I can ask them, would that be all right? Of course. Fantastic. So um, first question um, submitted is from uh, Sophia Bramchuk in Form 9, who asks, how did you start your career as an astronaut? And what challenges did you face on the way? Well, I like, uh, excellent question. Thank you for that, Sophia. Um, the question, um, you know, when did I start my career as an astronaut? I, I'm, I'm a private astronaut at the moment, so I'm not technically in a career. Uh, I'm not a commercial astronaut. Uh, but I started my lifelong dream to be an astronaut when I was eight years old. Um, that was when the space race was first beginning. Uh, Erica was in the race to get to the moon first. So it was easy to fall in love with space, and I certainly did, and I followed it my entire life. I did not become an astronaut in the first instance, but the first chance that came as now to become a private astronaut, I jumped at it um, and to fulfill, fulfill my dream of being an astronaut and to come here and do something with that. So uh, it's been a fabulous experience so far, and I look forward to the rest of the trip. Thank you very much, John. Um, the next question is from Joanna Salema in Form 10, who asks, um, how are you going to handle the change of gravity once you come back down to Earth? Is there a specific training regime that you need to do to prepare yourself? And will you have to quarantine? 
Well, at first, no quarantine, thankfully. We quarantined coming in, and that was primarily to protect uh, the current station crew from any sickness or any anything that we might have. Even a common cold is not very welcome here uh, in, in orbit. Um, but coming back, we all astronauts uh, physically train every day to keep bone density up, which is always good even when you're on Earth to do some get some exercise every day. Uh, but nothing specific to prepare for the return to gravity. Everyone has to come back and readjust in their own way, which may take a day or two. But um, we've been doing that for 60 years. We understand it well. Um, and it's a simple thing just to come back and uh, self-adjust. Thank you. Um, next question is from uh, Rodrigo Rocha in Form 11. What's your mission and purpose on, on the ISS? And are there specific tasks that you have to complete for research? And are you there as a scientist as well as a pilot? Uh, well, thank you for the question. Yes, uh, all three are true. Um, there are specific tasks that we must complete every day. We, uh, we come here as a crew to accomplish uh, some science for researchers on Earth that have been waiting a long time to get their science on orbit to experiment and to research their specific field of interest. So we all share tasks and duties, uh, whether it's uh, research for stem cell uh, development, RNA uh, development that we do in the glove box here. We also do research in uh, uh, growing blood every day to compare to our baseline uh, blood draws on Earth to see what changes in our bodies. Um, my primary mission, however, is STEM school outreach, you know, to develop an understanding and help teachers, educators, parents to understand the value of space and that every one of us have a message in us, a, a vision, a voice of ourselves by the time you're 10 or 12. And the schools and the teachers should learn to listen for that voice when a student says, I think I want to be an astronaut or I think I want to be a poet. Uh, those things are important to recognize and to a school to help foster the development of someone when they have an interest in something. So I think the awareness of space and what is can be accomplished up here is something that uh, you know, draws attention. So we're using that as a platform to raise awareness of all the things that are coming in future spaceflight uh, and that students, people around the world can be involved in, in many, many careers. Thank you, John. A question now from Francisco Ferreira, who's also in Form 11, who asks, to what extent do you think AI will help further research on pl in, in planet exploration for future colonization? Indeed, what are the uses of AI, if any, in your everyday work on the ISS? Uh, well, that's an excellent question. You know, AI is, is fast becoming a, a reality, a, a tool, um, something to be managed, I think, however. so. We don't use it here specifically as yet. It's still, you know, very much a product in development uh, on Earth. Um, for the future, however, you know, as we grow and reach into the into the solar system further with probes uh, and we study, then artificial intelligence is something that uh, needs to be developed for advanced probes that can go uh, out to remote landing sites um, and can make decisions on their own, make observations and conclusions. So the most powerful thing of AI, of course, is the database of information that we put in it so that it can make references just like the human brain does. Uh, as yet, I'm not sure how far we would want to turn it loose to trust it on its own, but it's certainly going to be a, a, an important tool for the future you know, for us to advance our exploration as we, uh, as we proceed. Thank you, John. A question now from Liv Pfeiffer. I suppose this question was always going to come. Um, have you ever seen anything, either from your research or your own experience, or anything that you're not allowed to tell us that would prove that alien life forms that are similar to humans exist? I, I wish I could answer that question with something exciting, but unfortunately, we don't have that yet, or at least they haven't told me, and I'm pretty sure I might get a hint if something were, were like that, but no. Um, you know, we, we see unusual things all the time, even in our history on Earth, things that we can't explain easily. Um, many come to pass as being natural developments. So we're always looking, you know, deciding what an alien truly is. 
we're always looking for that next sign of life, whether it be organic or some positive signal that we might receive one day, you know, from a distant star cluster or galaxy that can tell us that there is intelligent life existing there. Thank you, John. Um, a final question from one of the faculty. So how is research in microgravity helping to advance medical knowledge specifically? Well, many scientists you know, look for look for clues for how molecules or atoms or even basic materials function uh, and interact with each other. Uh, and on Earth, of course, we're bound by the effect of gravity, which has a profound effect on on about everything we do because of its, you know, its effect on mass. You know, in microgravity, we simply don't know all of the variables that might change without the effect of gravity. So researchers like to constantly experiment. If they have something that they believe uh, is a force of gravity on its mass, and they would choose to change that, the microgravity here on the ISS provides a platform for them to experiment and look further into their own ideas. It's part of that imagination set that is important to try to create something from an imagination that you don't know is reality yet. So on the ISS, you know, we have tons and tons of great equipment and gear to advance any sort of exploration that a scientist or researcher might want to do to see if the effect, the, the, without the effect of gravity, how their particular process might function. Uh, it's, it's really incredible, some of the discoveries that you can, uh, can make in microgravity. Thank you very much. Um, just during the launch, what we observed was that you looked incredibly calm. It looked very undramatic inside the capsule, but obviously it's pretty dramatic outside. Um, what, did it feel as calm as it looked? Uh, actually, it did. Uh, I was surprised by that, actually. You know, the, um, we did a dress rehearsal the day before, uh, and we all remarked how it was just like the simulations, just like our training. And I think that's the whole purpose is anything can be accomplished safely and correctly with proper training. And we spent hundreds and hundreds of hours in simulations in the Dragon capsule pre preparing for the launch. SpaceX did a fabulous job in in coaching, preparing, and training us, you know, quite hard actually, throwing lots of emergencies and uh, contingencies at us. So when it came time for the actual launch, I'm afraid it was uh, it was exciting to be there. It was very, it was in fact rather calm, and we could simply enjoy the ride. Thank you. Um, you're going around the Earth, I think, 16 times. You're seeing 16 sunsets, 16 sunrises and you're 250 miles up. Is it what you were expecting? Is it better? Just try and give us a sense of how amazing it is. Well, it is amazing. I wish we had more words than just amazing, fantastic, awesome, all those things, because they, they fall short, actually, when you first stick your head in the cupola here and see the Earth. We can see almost the full curvature from any, we can see it from any side. Uh, and to see the thin layer of atmosphere that protects us and the beautiful, beautiful blue ball and clouds and land going by. And it goes by quite quickly. We're uh, only 250 miles above Earth, which if you can think of what is 250 miles from you and then, yes, another city or town, and then stand that straight up. And that's where we are. And we do go by uh, every 90 minutes. Um, and it's just an awesome sight to experience the first time. Um, thank you very much, John. Uh, we just want to thank you so much for your time today. It's been absolutely wonderful and a privilege to speak to you. Um, a final question, really. Um, yep, there we go. A little bit of, <laughs> that's fantastic. Um, just a final question from us and, 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 and a, a request. Um, we know that you have a home here in Northern Portugal. Um, and uh, please, please, when you get back to Earth, next time you come to Portugal, we'd love it if you were able to come along to the school and, and, and maybe speak to us and give us a little bit of a sense of, um, well, in person, um, how it's been for you. That would be a real, that would be just wonderful if you could. 
you know, I, I would in fact love to do that. And I would, I will plan to do that um, in the fall uh, when I'm back in Portugal. Uh, we'll make a schedule and come by um, because I think it's incredibly important that for any student or any person that's inspired about the aspects of what can come of space travel, uh, what can come of research in space, what can come of being involved in technology for space flight. Not, not everyone needs to be an astronaut or needs to want to be an astronaut. They simply need to have an imagination and a desire to move out and advance their own imagination in what are the possibilities. Um, so everyone, again, with, has that voice of the vision of themselves. They have that vision of themselves and to move forward with that. Every action that they take should take them in that direction in a positive way. And the teachers and parents should encourage that. Thank you, John. Well, we certainly got a room full of students who are inspired today. So thank you very much to everyone with Axiom and particularly to you, John. It's been a real privilege. Thank you. Thank you. It's been an honor to be here. Thank you. And to all the students, go find your dream and make it work. Thanks. Thank you and bye-bye, John. Thank you. Good luck.